Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Tang Yanling from Hunan Normal University. I'm honored to host this morning session. Welcome to take part in the 2021 Hunan Normal University International Conference on Multimodal Communication. This morning, three speakers will share the ideas on emerging computational and technical methods. Now, let me introduce the first speaker, Professor Mark Turner. Mark Turner, Institute Professor and Professor of Cognitive Science at the Case Western Reserve University, Dr. Honoris Holder, University of the Access. Before joining the faculty at the Case Western Reserve University, he was distinguished university professor at the University of Maryland and associate director of the St. For advanced study in the behavioral science at Stanford. He's founding the director of the Cognitive Science Network, co-director of the Writing Lab. He has won many prizes and honors, such as winner of the Annalise Mayer Research Prize from the Alexander Humboldt Foundation. Founding president of the Merrifield Institute for Cognition and the Arts. Um, fellow of the Institute for Advanced Study, the Center for Advanced Study in the Behavioral Sciences, the National Humanities Center, the John Simon Copenhagen Memorial Foundation, etc. Uh, external research professor of the Krasnow Institute for Advanced Study. Visiting Scholar Department of Linguistics, Stanford. Visiting Scholar Department of Cognitive Science and Linguistics, UCSD. Distinguished Visiting Professor at Hunan Normal University. Please don't hesitate to join me in welcome our first speaker, Professor Mark Turner, whose topic is Computational Tools for Research and Frames and Frame Blending. Let's welcome. Thank you. So today we're going to talk about tools and tomorrow, we're going to talk about emerging tools for researching communication. Um, Human beings have been studying communication for thousands of years and their insights are invaluable. What we're going to be talking about are just tools that might make the research a little more powerful, have a wider reach, that might help the human researchers do things that otherwise they would not have the time uh, to do, would not have a um, range of data to, uh, to tackle. Now, the kind of communication that I'm going to talk about today is the kind that depends upon what we call in cognitive science and cognitive linguistics, conceptual frames. So Charles Fillmore at Berkeley was one of my professors, and uh, he's known as the founder of frame semantics, although, of course, there were many precursors uh, to that. And um, a frame is kind of a bundled set of knowledge. We all have lots of knowledge and we might not all know the knowledge that other people have, but there are certain kinds of knowledge that I will say your language expects you to have in the sense that if something is said to you in a certain way, you are supposed to be able to call up a little bundle of knowledge when that is said. So if somebody says, uh, I have to call my stockbroker, you're expected to be able to call up the frame for buying and selling something, because that's what a broker does. And you might even call up the frame for buying and selling securities, maybe Bitcoin or Coinbase or Ethereum or something like that. Now, a frame has got elements. They're usually roles, and we know things go in them. 
So if there's a buy and a sell agreement, we think that something is going to be transferred from the seller to the buyer, even though the language doesn't say anything about that. You're expected to be able to call that up. So let's take an example of a frame that Fillmore himself talked about, the risk frame. When someone says, I risked my life, you need to be able to call up a frame in which there's an action, some action that creates the risk. There's some asset, there's something that's desirable, possessed by or directly associated with a protagonist, which might be lost or damaged. So if you risk your boat to the waves, well, the boat is the asset and the action is something. We didn't even say what, but maybe you launched it out into the waves. There's a chance for a bad outcome that the protagonist would like to avoid. And the protagonist is the person who's at risk of that bad outcome. You know when someone says the word risk that you're expected to be able to activate this bundle of organized knowledge, uh, even though maybe not all of it will be used. So here's an example of uh, a frame. It's provided by Hans Boas, who is a major researcher in uh, frame semantics. He's at the University of Texas, Austin. And this example comes from Texas, uh, where he works, right? So Rick avenged the death of his pet armadillo by killing the coyote. Now, maybe you don't even know what an armadillo is. There's some killing of a coyote here, but if you have the risk frame, then you are able to use it to make sense of the elements that are mentioned. So, for example, you know that um, there is an act of vengeance, and Rick is the avenger, and the punishment is death, and the injuring party is the coyote, and the pet armadillo was the injured party, and there's a loss to Rick because it was his pet. Now, this sentence doesn't say any of that but it prompts you by using a word like avenge to call up this entire frame. And this is knowledge that we are expected to have, organized knowledge, if we're native speakers of the language. We can characterize these frames with these kinds of roles and requirements for what goes in them. Not all of them need to be there, they can be combined in some ways. So for instance, it's often the case that the avenger is the injured party. That is something, somebody does something to somebody and then they take revenge. So in that case, they're both the injured party and the avenger, right? There are participants and sub events. So we would have to go on for quite a while as Hans Boas does just to talk about what is in the frame for uh, avenge. But it's something we all know. Um, we know how to look at the constructions, the forms that are combined in the expression as prompts for that frame. So Rick is the avenger. The injury is the death of the pet armadillo and the punishment is killing the coyote, right? the different parts of uh, that frame are expressed in different parts of uh, this sentence, different grammatical parts of this sentence. Now, there are many ways for communicative performance to prompt for a conceptual frame, right? In English, for instance, there's what's called an emblem. It's just a gesture. It's where you take a circle of your finger and do it around your ear. This means crazy. Right? So if you look at somebody and do this, up comes the whole frame for a person who is insane, who has, is behaving in a crazy kind of way. But uh, as you know, signs and uh, gestures and uh, um, 
the flowers in a certain spot and, a, and colors on certain posters and so on are all ways, every performance that a human being can do, looking in a certain direction, rolling your eyes, these are all prompts that can call up conceptual frames. So it's not just words like avenge that can call up frames. And I'll give you an example of this. We have in English and you have in Chinese just as well, and in all the other languages I've looked at, a kind of caused motion frame. It's relativized to the very basic scene in which it's an agent, an actor, somebody like a human being, performs an action on an object, like maybe a ball, that causes the ball to go in a direction. It's caused motion. So something moves, and the reason it moves is that an actor performed an action to make it move, right? And we have some words that call this frame up all by themselves, like throw. For throw, when I use the word throw, you not only know that there's an action with a thrower, you also know that there's an object and there's a direction, and you probably even know something about the manner of the action and the manner of the motion. That word all by itself is a good prompt for calling up the cause motion frame. But notice, um, if I say Bill floated the boat to me, float is not a cause, it's not natively or intrinsically a caused motion verb. That is something perfectly still can be floating. It's not moving at all. It's just the lily pad that's just floating on the water. However, if I say Bill floated the boat to me, there's a grammatical syntactical pattern, noun phrase, verb phrase, noun phrase, prepositional phrase. And that's a very good clausal form to prompt us to use the cause motion frame. So you think, in fact, if you're a native speaker of English, that Bill did something, you don't know what. Maybe it was a remote control, maybe he pushed it with a stick, maybe he made the water move the boat. Bill performed some action that caused the boat to move in my direction. And where does float come from? Well, that's part of the manner of the movement of the boat. It's not Bill's manner, uh, and we don't know what action he performed. So here we have a case of an entire clause without any words in it, that when filled with words is a prompt for the cause motion frame. And this kind of knowledge is part of the indispensable knowledge that a speaker of any language has. You have to not only have frames, you have to know which frames the language expects you to be able to call up and when, and as we'll get to, how to combine them. Now, uh, Charles Fillmore set up at Berkeley um, in the Department of Linguistics and at the International Computer Science Institute in Berkeley, FrameNet. And FrameNet was a project to try to analyze and gather frames and talk about their relationship to language, in particular English, of course. So there's the translating frame, which I know is a very big deal at the College of Foreign Studies at Hunan Normal University, famous for ability to translate with some very distinguished translators uh, on board. Well, the translation frame is conceptual frame. There's some kind of cognizer thinker that produces a target symbol, which represents in the target representation format, a content that pre-exists in the form of a source symbol in a source representation format. So for instance, if you translate English into Chinese, and as I mentioned, they just translated one of my books with Frank Thomas, Clear and simple is the truth, writing classic prose into Chinese. It'll be out in a few weeks. Well, then the source symbol is, this, is the book in English, English being the source representation form. And Chinese, the Chinese version, we say, is going to be the target symbol. 
and it will be, of course, in Mandarin. And uh, there's a translator, in this case, uh, the Cognizer. The revenge frame looks like something like this. If you go to Berkeley FrameNet, and you can do this right now. You go to this website and you will see, if you look at the navigation bar on the left here, not only a great range of frames that have been characterized, um, but also words that connect to them. And you can work at, look at words or lexical units because a lexical unit doesn't have to be exactly a word and see what frames that word is conventionally used to call up. So here we have the Berkeley FrameNet characterization of the revenge frame. This frame concerns the infliction of punishment return for a wrong suffered. And as, as you see, it goes through and it picks out all of the different possible uh, roles, the frame elements, including the main frame elements, the core frame of elements that is, and the sub, uh, uh, sub elements, uh, and gives you examples. They took revenge for the deaths of two loyalist prisoners. Lachlan went out to avenge them. The next day, the Roman forces took revenge on their enemies. So this is a great resource, a terrific uh, resource. It is put together by hand. It was put together by hand. There were a number of linguists, uh, people who are very well known to us. They continue to work um, in Global FrameNet, which we'll be hearing about from uh, Chago Torres. Um, and these were hand analyzed. They were, of course, um, represented in a, a web page, but this is not uh, computational, right? Um, we are, however, able to tag for frames using just computational techniques in Red Hen Lab. So Red Hen Lab can go through a bunch of data that no human being has looked at, that's captured without a human being looking at, looking at it, without, it's not analyzed by a human being. Like a player was injured during the game and also taken to the hip to the hospital unrelated to the fight. And it picks out using um, a software like a semaphore and automatic uh, semantic resolution software and so on, which frames it thinks are active in that sentence. Now, it's not particularly good. We would like it to be much better. We have to work on that, of course. But what it does mean is that when the computer encounters a sentence like Orange County may get a hint of a marine layer, it understands that this is about the likelihood of a weather vent in a political locale. Now, you may not have known that Orange County is a political locale, but named entity recognition does. You, when you were thinking of likelihood, you may not have thought about words like may and hint as perhaps calling up the frame of likelihood, right? You might not even know that a marine layer is a weather event. I'm from Southern California, so I do. But the point is the system knows. So if you say, hi, I would now like to have as many sentences as I can get that are about the likelihood of a weather event for a political locale, then you will find this one. The computer will find it for you and put it up in a list of probable examples. Um, this is what I mean by trying to use computation, computational techniques um, to do work that are really beyond the scope of the human being. It's very, very hard to develop analyses of frames and to get just the right examples. But the computer can have big data that takes no human involvement and it can analyze that data for language and we're beginning to be able to analyze it for frames and then you can search for them and you can find patterns that you, you know you might have sat around for a month and not heard that pattern with that frame but the computer will find you lots of examples of it so these kinds of computational techniques are developed sort of all over the place. We've done an awful lot of it in Google Summer of Code. Google sponsors such projects. 
And if you go to markturner.org and you click on the icon for Red Hen Lab, you'll go to our website and one of the things you will see is the seven years of Google Summer of Code that we have run. Many students have been mentored to write code, to develop computational techniques to help us analyze communication. Uh, you'll be hearing a lot about LUTMA, which is a system that allows individuals to describe and represent frames because the original frame that is really quite limited. You know lots of frames about Chinese history, Chinese philosophy. Uh, Dean Zhang Yenyu uh, quoted Confucius about receiving friend, friends from afar. So you have uh, the frame for the sage who provides um, analysis of uh, human conditions. Um, but those are not in FrameNet. They're not in Berkeley FrameNet, right? Most things are not in Berkeley FrameNet. Most frames just haven't been organized. Uh, and one of the things that we could do is ask, how can the scholars around the world of communication d help develop a system where we can characterize the frames that uh, the world is, is using. And this tool, LUTMA, is um, a tool to help people contribute to FrameNet. But actually, I use it just as much in order to teach students about what a frame is. Because although it's pretty recent, it has wonderful tutorials on here are the frames we know, this is what a, this frame element is. This is how the, these are the main relationships that can obtain between frames and so on. So while the students are actually contributing to science by providing new frames, they're also learning more about the theory. And this will often be the case. The methods will help research, but they will also help the uh, pedagogy. Uh, global FrameNet, uh, you'll be hearing more about. I would recommend if you want to learn about the emergence of computational techniques for developing uh, FrameNet, that you go to the globalframenet.org uh, website. They um, have many, many presentations there on the latest and greatest computational and technical methods that they have uh, put together. Uh, in particular, I recommend one that happened just a few days ago about German FrameNet and the German FrameNet Constructicon. Because of course, frames are attached to language and language is a matter of form meaning pairs. There are forms that prompt for meanings. So one thing we might say, one way to think about knowing what a communicative system is, is that knowing a language means knowing a relational network of form meaning pairs and how they blend, how they can combine into actual expressions. Knowing a communicative system more generally is knowing a relational network of form meaning pairs and how they can be blended in order to prompt for meaning. So I recommend these uh, resources to you. Uh, now, I want to talk a little bit about a next step in the analysis of frames. It's very often the case that human beings with their extraordinary mental imaginations, their extraordinary creativity can blend frames in particular frames that don't really, that should never be confused. Um, it's, it might seem that blending things that are deeply incompatible would be something that evolutionarily we should not do, but in fact, we seem to be specialized for it. So I gave a talk on frame blending. Um, in uh, 2006, something like that. Uh, Chuck Fillmore gave the first talk, I gave the second, and uh, I quoted his work with Atkins in my presentation of uh, frame blending. You can download this from markturner.org, right? So here's an example of frame blending in everyday language, and yes, it's about risk. So you have uh, the frame for chance something could happen. There's a chance that something could happen. It's, there's also a chance that it won't. And you have the idea of what could happen, what could be the outcomes. 
sometimes you have the idea that you're in a situation where there's a chance of harm, which means you have to have both the frame for chance and the frame for harm. And they're not, uh, uh, neither implies the other. You can know that harm is coming and it's 100% certain, right? You can also have chance, but both of the outcomes are good or relatively good. So you have to blend chance and harm. You also can blend in another frame, and that is a risk taking. That's choice. You actually choose to put yourself in a situation where there's a chance of harm. So that's three different frames, choosing, chance, and harm. And if you get those, then you have the different varieties of risk. There are other kinds of frame blends. Um, uh, Fillmore and Atkins call them uh, the expression of these uh, associated syntax. I call it blended syntax. So for instance, if you um, smeared mud on the wall, that means there's a little mud on the wall, or that's what it could mean. But if you smear the wall with mud, most people tend to think that you covered the wall or substantially covered the wall with mud. Cover takes uh, with, you cover something with something. So if you cover the wall with mud, then you get frames not only for smearing, but also for covering. Similarly for like load and fill. If you load hay on, on the truck, it means potentially that there's some hay on the truck. But if you load the truck with hay, people tend to think that you in fact filled it because the load and the width and the smear and the width are blended syntax that are prompting you to, you to make a frame blend. Similarly, you can uh, risk something to, you can risk something on, you can risk something in. So if you expose your boat to the waves, then you risk your boat to the waves. If you bet or wager on a horse, then you've risked your money on the horse. If you invest money in the stock market, then you have risked, risked your money in the stock market. So why do you get risk to, risk on, risk in, in different situations? Because it's blended syntax prompting you to blend frames. We're very familiar with uh, uh, this kind of blending of, uh, of frames. We see it in all kinds of everyday representations that are pyrotechnic. In these cases, you can actually see the blend. I mean, making coffee is not the same thing as having psychology, but here, pressing down the filter in uh, the French press coffee pot is blended with getting control of one's negative impulses so one that can be socially appropriate. The pandemic has brought out a great number of uh, these kinds of frame blends. And uh, I recommend uh, Ronnie Chang's uh, stand-up comedy on, it's a blend of internet watching and smoking. In 50 years, people are going to regard internet smoking the way, internet watching the way we, we regard smoking now. That is, you know, don't bring the internet inside. Uh, it's the secondhand stupidity that kills. Very, very funny. Now, can we do automatic tagging for frame blends? Well, there happens to be a construction, X is the Y of Z, that's really, really good at prompting for frame blends. My first book was called Death is the Mother of Beauty. Now, death and mother are prompt for very, very different frames. This is a very poetic example where you're supposed to blend those frames and come to see that the conception of death is in fact the cause of human ability to have aesthetic response. Now, one might disagree with that, but you understand what the frame blend is, or at least you do when you read the poem. Well, in the very early days, I tried to write regular expressions that would find X is the Y of Z constructions because of course, they're really good at, at frame blends. So here is, a, um, here is an example. Are you seeing this? 
my monitor shows that you're not seeing this. So let me share again and see if this works. So I'm going to look in the chat here. Can someone tell me whether or not you can see my screen? You see, you see the regex, good. Okay, then it's working for you. That's just what I wanted to hear. Yes, so I, uh, uh, I wrote this code to find X is the Y of Z examples. And in the space of a few seconds, I found 100,000 100, examples. Now we have much better uh, techniques now. That is, we can use natural language processing that will tag for parts of speech and other kinds of um, uh, grammatical constructions. And so you can write some code that will find you X is the Y of Z. In fact, we can do this much more slickly now, and we can see, in fact, the, the actual examples. We also have another technique, which is CQP web. Uh, the Red Hint version is put together by Peter Urig. Uh, it uses the same kind of software that, um, it uses the same kind of software that the British National Corpus uses. And it's really just magical. It's spectacular. It lets you find not only XYZs, but things related to uh, XYZ, like the Z equivalent, right? You say something like, um, the bridge repair uh, was the, if this, is the, this is the equivalent, this is the bridge equivalent of a hip repair, right? Which is a different kind of XYZ. Now, you can test these things now, and I won't go through this, except to say this is a case where I've taken um, a lot of linguistic analysis that I did, partly uh, with Gilles Fauconnier on the X is the Y of Z construction. And now I can actually get as many different kinds of examples of this for analysis as you can imagine. Can we come up with other techniques? for uh, locating frame blending and analysis, uh, analyzing these. Well, a year and a half ago, Suzy Shi, who was an art historian and a computer scientist at Smith and is now in computer science at NYU, was one of our Google Summer of Code students. And she made a frame blend nomination uh, system. Uh, you can find out all about this at uh, her website. And what she did is take the um, computer system for word embedding. Now, word embedding is a matter of finding um, finding words that are close and far apart in meaning. Essentially, you turn the word into a vector, and the vectors for words that have a big overlap in meaning are very, very close. And the vectors for words that don't have much of an overlap in meaning are very far apart. And she extended that to frame embedding. So she developed a system of representing frames uh, with uh, a vector. And now you can say, okay, here's frame cluster A, frame cluster B. I want all the examples where within a very short linguistic space, we call up both frame A and frame B. And the computer can now go through 500,000 hours of human communication, can you imagine, to locate what it think might, thinks might be a frame blend. So this is just a review of the current state of computational tools to help us research frames and frame blending. And I point out that when I was an undergraduate, and when I was a graduate student, working with Chuck Fillmore, the founder of the theory of conceptual frames, we had none of this capability. So 
not only in my lifetime, in my lifetime since I, I was a graduate student, right, since 1970s, 1980s, uh, we have brought a wave of data science into the study of a central area of the theory of communication. Thank you very much. Uh, Mark Turner, thank you for the impressive speech. And now uh, about 15 minutes left for both question and answer. So now we end into the question and answer session. Uh, during this session, Professor Mark Turner will be very happy to answer as many as possible. Sorry, can I ask the question? Yes. You can also just put uh, questions into the chat, if those of you who are online. Uh, I will just uh, speak this. Uh, uh, thank you, Professor. I am really intrigued by your uh, presentation, especially on the natural language processing and the computational science. And uh, I know that uh, for uh, natural language processing, there are many uh, taggers like uh, Stanford Core NLP, like uh, USAS, and uh, also you have proposed a wholly different uh, uh, way of a uh, wholly different realm for tagging, uh, like FrameNet. So my first question was like this. Uh, there are two kinds of errors for uh, any kind of uh, tagging or formula. Uh, type one error and type two error which means that uh, whether you can detect the true false or the false positive or negative, um, false negative like that. So uh, my question firstly is like this, how is the type one error, type two error for, your, uh, for the software you propose? And secondly, uh, could you please make a brief comment on the uh, Stanford Core NLP and the uh, uh, US in S and uh, what embedding, how can they, uh, the three, support uh, the frame net uh, differently? Thank you. Yes, thank you very much for those questions. Well, of course, this research is all embryonic. We're always happy when there's some success. Uh, we're always happy when science is pushed one inch forward, but we're in very, very early days. And you're quite right that the, uh, the, the, the machine is not nearly as good as the individual. The, the point is never to substitute for the, uh, the knowledge and expertise of the individual. The point is to make the individual 100 times faster, able to handle 1,000 times more data than an individual could ever handle. I mean, uh, Astronomers have logarithms, right? And uh, Lagrange said that the invention of logarithms doubled the life of the astronomer because now you can just do things so much faster. And that's the point. These things will get things wrong. So if you look at all of the references we've given, you'll see that there are lots of considerations of how to train, how to retrain, what's the best kind of data to train a system on. Um, very, uh, very often we have what's called a human in the loop system, because if you can connect up the human expertise with the computational speed and tirelessness, then you get better and better uh, systems. But of course, these days, the entire point is to work on systems so you get fewer false positives, fewer false negatives. The, the false positives are not as much of the problem as the false negatives, because the human in the loop can, is, recognizes a false positive. The machine says, hi, this is this kind of thing, and the human being says, no, it isn't, right? But if the machine is getting a false negative, the machine doesn't think that this is part of this pattern, but in fact, it is 
how will the human being ever see, see it? So the false negatives are actually a much, a much bigger threat. Um, we use many different kinds of natural language processing systems. We develop a few of them. Many of these are developed in China. So for automatic speech recognition, uh, we, use, we use just the kinds of things that we've talked about in China before. We, we use, uh, you know, paddle paddle, uh, we, 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 we use uh, just the kinds of uh, platforms that uh, you use. And of course, the whole world is trying to make these things better. We have seen staggering examples in WeChat. Just look at what WeChat can do by the way of analyzing the spoken word and the written word that you put uh, out. That's all part of this. But I would say we don't want to over we don't want to over represent. Remember, um, when I tried to do regular expression analysis of this, I was using skills that uh, I learned in the 70s and that were still very common in the early 80s. Right. It's only 40 years later and the development that we're seeing in the entire world of uh, technological tools to help the analyst of language, literature, translation, gesture, and so on, is staggering. It's, only, it's, it's been done in two generations, 40 years. But we're still at the beginning. They, everyone is very humble about this. Uh, what we want to do is figure out what's wrong and what's, what's the next best way to move it forward. Thank you for your question. Thank you very much, Mark, for your uh, talk. Uh, it's Ping Yang from the Western Sydney uh, University. Um, you talked about the um, source language, you know, translated uh, into the target language uh, through the, you know, language symbols. Uh, you also talked about the different cluster of word, uh, frames of words and expressions uh, through the computing system. Now, my question is about how that system or model can uh, deal with the cultural specific words and expressions uh, in translation, just like in any, the sentence you, you, uh, you, you gave, uh, you know, the, the death is the beauty of the mother. It may make sense to some language speakers, while not very much to others. So yeah, that's 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 just yeah. the right that's just the right question. And of course, what I would say, notice that frame net or the analysis of frames is not an attempt to find the truth. It's an attempt to find what are the conceptual bundles of knowledge that people are expected to have in cultures and subcultures. There are frames for the worst and most mistaken things that anybody has ever come up with. And you know those trends. And in fact, when somebody says them, you say, well, that person's completely wrong. And the reason you know they're, or the reason that you can understand their communication as wrong is because they're came, calling up a frame that you don't have to believe. So knowing a frame is not at all the same as agreeing with it or liking it or anything like that. It's, it's just a matter of what are the bundles that you think other people expect to have. Well, one of the problems we have with frames, frame that, is that they were until recently almost entirely just about English. And indeed, coastal Californian English, and indeed kind of the kind of English that a linguist likes, because you want to look at certain main verbs like have and the funny way they perform. So Chuck Fillmore founded this. So of course, that's how it got started. But as I said at the beginning, one of the problems that we have is we don't have nearly the organization of frames for different cultures that we'd like to have. The global frame net system, which you'll be hearing a lot more about, does indeed have a lot of uh, activity in German, even Chinese, uh, but we need much, much more. Now, part of the problem for the translator is the translator, a good translator, will know that this frame, which is familiar in, I don't know, Hunan, is not 
familiar in Kentucky and certainly not familiar in Tuscany, right? So the, the translator is sitting there trying to figure out how to substitute frames. And it's a very artistic, difficult kind of choice. Different translators and different schools of translation actually have philosophies and principles about what are the kinds of choices that a translator might make in these cases. The system is not in any way going to eliminate the need to make those choices. However, notice that if we did have the more frames we have that we can apply to texts, the more people will be able to get some extra help in understanding things that they otherwise would not have understood in poetry or journalism, just because they're lacking the frame. I, so I, I won't do it here, but I have slide after slide after slide of things that are perfectly grammatical in all kinds of languages, but that people don't understand because they don't have the frame. They know what they're supposed to do with it, but they just can't do it because they don't have uh, the frame. So one of the largest um, tasks we have going forward is to try to expand our knowledge of the frames that are expected in the variety of the world's, uh, the world's languages. And uh, we, we don't have that. That's, that's something that I hope two generations from now, somebody looks back at and says, well, we've come a long way since then. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you all. Remember, I'm markturner.org and my credentials are on my website. And if you want to write to me about anything in this, just write, send me an email. I will get back to you. Thank you. Um, thank you. Because I have a limited time, if you have any questions, you can contact, uh, contact Professor Mark Turner after the conference. Yeah. Um, uh, with many pictures, videos, diagrams, examples, Mark Turner shows us in detail uh, how we we'll use data science to study the vast mental operations of framing and frame blending, right? So if you wish to explore the current state of data science tools for the study of frames, uh, you can register a global frame lab workshop. Uh, thank you again, Professor Mark Turner.